Despite his stunning victory at Kalugareni, the outnumbered Mihai retreats north, unable to stop Sinan Pasha's advance. The two capitals fall just three days after the battle. Lahia, which had produced so much resistance under Mihai the Brave, looks destined to become an Ottoman province. Today's video is sponsored by NordVPN. During centuries of Ottoman domination, Vlahia continued its existence as a political entity through careful management of relations with Constantinople. Vlahian nobility usually avoided an overly aggressive stance towards the Ottoman Empire. In most cases, the Voivods accepted the suzerainty of the Sultan and sought good relations by paying tribute and bribing important officials. But Vlahian Voivods have equally shown that occupying their lands would be met with harsh resistance. And since the Principality lacked valuable natural resources, like gold or silver, from the Ottoman perspective, it was more profitable to keep Vlahia as a tax farm than to engage in costly wars and occupation. And if not overtaxed, as was the case in the years before Mihai's revolt, Vlahia was generally peaceful. And for the Vlahian nobility, the pro-Ottoman policies were a legitimate way to maintain their rule and keep the country free from total occupation, even if vassalized and forced to pay high tributes. But over the centuries, some Vlahian voivods broke these norms and aggressively sought independence for their people. Mihai was one of them. The Vlahian revolt he led caused a significant disruption to Ottoman lines of communication along the Danube for their main theatre of war against the Holy League in Hungary. As a result, Constantinople moved to dismantle and annex Vlahia in order to fully secure the logistically vital Danube line. Unaffected by the tactical defeat at Kalugareni, the Ottomans were able to replace their losses and start incorporating Vlahia into the empire. The initial military takeover is swift, as nearly all towns have neither castles nor stone walls. By late August, Ottoman officials are already put in charge over large parts of the country. However, by September, Sinan's preparations for permanent occupation are not going well. The Akinji raiders are plundering and ravaging the country, leading to fierce local resistance and widespread instability. Vlahian rebels clash and defeat several groups of Akinji forces, most notable of which is the massacre of 5,000 raiders near Buzau. Despite these setbacks, it is only a matter of time before the Ottomans have Lahia firmly in their grip. Having retreated to the Bran Pass, Mihai knows that he needs a second victory to inflict enough losses on the Ottomans if he is to discourage further attacks on Vlahia and maybe seek a political compromise. But in the weeks following the Battle of Kalugareni, many Vlahian peasants leave his army to defend their homes from Akinji attacks. This significantly weakens his ranks. In addition, the fall of Bucharest and Targoviste is an indication to the nobility that Mihai had lost the war. Thus, many nobles east of the Alt River see no reason to follow him anymore, and they too withdraw their troops. However, he still enjoys significant support from the nobility in Altenia, his power base. To make matters worse, despite being immensely wealthy, Bankrolling so many mercenaries depleted his funds, and he finds it increasingly difficult to pay for their services. Some leave his army to look for employment elsewhere, but others stay, as finding well-paid employment in the region isn't that easy, because the market is flooded with cheap manpower after the destruction of the countryside and the abandonment of many towns, as well as the ending of the harvest season left many looking for work. As a result of all these factors, Mihai's army is down to 8,000 men, and the Transylvanian reinforcements can't come soon enough. However, 
While Vla here is being pillaged, Sigismund decides to get married before marching south. By forcing Mihai to wait until his wedding is over, Sigismund, perhaps, wants to show who's in charge. But by October, the Transylvanian Voivod finally arrives with his army. Help also comes from Moldavia. Stephen Razafan, a highly competent military leader and Voivod, who is very popular among his men, arrives with his contingent. The three Voivods waste no time. Their combined army numbers around 32,000 men and 100 cannons. It is agreed that Mihai devise a plan for a swift advance, aiming to attack Sinan's position before he can fully organize his army. At this time, Sinan has up to 40,000 combat troops at his disposal, while the rest are dispersed across Vlahia. Armies of the three Voivods advance on Torgoviste. With 40 cannons, the Ottoman garrison offers stiff resistance. Over the next two days, much of the town is engulfed in flames during an intense artillery battle. The Ottoman garrison finally retreats, fearing that their storage of gunpowder could explode, but most are eventually killed in the burning city or taken prisoner. All 40 cannons, as well as many supplies and weapons, are taken by the advancing army. Ottoman soldiers that manage to escape report back to Bucharest. Upon learning of the approaching army, Sinan decides to retreat south across the Danube and regroup. Not wanting to leave anything for the advancing enemy, the Ottomans sack and burn Bucharest and blow up the wooden fortifications. He reasons that it would be risky to go against an army of that size, which includes a very strong contingent of heavy cavalry, professional infantry, armed with arquebuses and pistols, and nearly 150 artillery pieces. The retreating column is hastily organized. Sedan places himself in the front, along with his advisors, high-ranking officers, and the most valuable troops. The center of the column is rather mixed, while the Akinjis, who are usually fast and agile moving, form the rear due to being weighed down by plunder and slowed by thousands of slaves that they captured over the past several weeks of raiding. In order to catch the fleeing Ottomans, the three Romanian voivods pass by Bucharest, sending only a small Moldavian contingent to enter the city and continue marching on the road to Kalugareni and Giorgio. The two armies finally sight each other. While the Ottomans are crossing the pontoon bridge over the Danube, the three Romanian voivods appear to the north of Giorgio. Even before the rest of the column has arrived, the quick-thinking Mihai is the first to attack. Seeing the Ottomans are focused on crossing the river and haven't formed a consistent battle formation, he seizes the initiative and personally leads the charge, urging his men forward. He doesn't want to give the enemy any time to fully form their battle line, the Ottomans amass their plunder and carts to form a barricade in order to slow down the Vlahian charge. Mihai's contingent goes around and over the obstacles and clashes with the Ottoman center and right flank. Sinan's troops on the bridge have no room to maneuver their way back into the battle and can only keep moving forwards across the river. Meanwhile, Transylvanian arquebus infantrymen form up in front of the Ottoman left and begin firing at will. Many are immediately cut down in a hail of bullets. In the center, the Ottoman barricades locked Mihai in a bitter fight against the Akinji cavalry. Nevertheless, the Vlahians slowly push towards the river. Further back, Transylvanian and Vlahian cannons are brought into position, and they open fire on the retreating army. As Sinan and his most valuable troops cross to the other side, the bridge behind them catches fire. Engulfed in flames, many soldiers jump into the river. Minutes later, the damaged bridge collapses, taking with it the unfortunate soldiers, horses and pack animals, and most of them drown in the Danube's strong currents. Across the river, the Akinjis and many others are now cut off, unwilling to let go of the plunder and slaves they had captured, which are slowing them down. In the chaos, some of the horsemen are still trying to retreat across the river, unaware that the bridge had collapsed. 
By now they are heavily outnumbered and quickly start suffering massive casualties. After hours of fighting, the Ottomans lost about 3,000 men, while another several thousand were wounded. 6,000 slaves are freed, 150 camels, as well as much of the supplies, weapons and artillery, are left behind. Mihai got his victory. The Battle of Giorgio marked the end of the Ottoman ambition to transform Vlahia into an Ottoman province. Moreover, the battle impacted the fate of the Akinjis as a military institution. The famous horsemen, who had the mission to plunder and weaken enemy territories, were already in decline by the late 16th century. But after the Battle of Giorgio, their operations became minimal, as the style of warfare across Europe began to change. But it's important to note that just as the Akinjis raided Christian lands during peacetime, so too did Christian forces raid Ottoman lands. These raids did not break peace agreements and were practiced by both sides almost every year. This is why the populace that lived in affected areas hated these raiders. And on the battlefield at Giorgio, most of the Vlahian, Moldovian and Transylvanian troops were born and raised in areas that were ravaged by the Akinjis. Needless to say, they hated them and therefore massacred them all, renouncing any ransom. Finally, after hours of fighting, the bridge was cleared and some of the Ottoman troops retreated to the castle of Giorgio, which was attacked on October 19th with 12 cannons of the Toscan artillerymen that were brought closer to the shore. Ottoman ships tried to intervene to stop the bombardment, but were prevented by the Vlahian and Transylvanian artillery. Two ships were eventually sunk. The Ottoman garrison in the castle made a brave last stand, staving off several assaults while under heavy bombardment. But after hours of fighting, their numbers dwindled, and the castle eventually fell one day later. After the battle, Sinan began planning a general invasion of Lahia to massacre and displace the population as punishment for their resistance. From a military standpoint, this was a reasonable and effective measure, which was successfully implemented in other problematic regions as well. But Sinan never got the chance to execute his plans. His retreat from Vlahia was regarded as shameful. The man who had masterminded so many victories in Hungary against the Holy League was stripped of his position as Grand Vizier. Across the Danube, Sigismund fulfilled his duty of providing support to Mihai and retreated to Transylvania to avoid keeping his army in the field when the snow falls, as mercenaries and vassals demanded more payment during the winter. Grasvan returned to Moldavia. But during his absence, Polish noblemen brought the pro-Ottoman pretender Jeremia Avila to the throne. Hrasvan fought to regain the throne, but was defeated. With Jeremia recognized by the Sultan, Mihai became threatened by a potential Moldavian military intervention. Conflict seemed inevitable, and the war with the Ottomans also continued. But Vlahia was mostly in ruins. Many peasants fled, leaving some areas depopulated. Towns suffered massive damage. This made the collection of taxes very difficult, which further worsened Mihai's financial situation. In order to start rebuilding the economy, the fortress of Brela was attacked and conquered. As one of the most important ports on the Danube, Brela immediately alleviated some of Mihai's financial problems, thanks to the highly valuable commercial taxation. In addition, by controlling Brela, Mihai gained a strategically important position against Moldavia. He could attack and then retreat to the fortress, while Moldavia had no fortresses in the south of the country. All of them were dismantled on the orders of the Sultan. Ottomans responded by sending Tatar raiders into Vlahia to attack Targoviste. Although they had the element of surprise, the Tatars only had a narrow corridor to go through and their movement was easy to predict. Mihai intercepted and destroyed their army. Meanwhile, another operation was launched in the west to take the fortress of Vidin, while Mihai marched south to conquer the fortress of Nicopolis. 
During spring, Mihai had to dismiss many of his mercenaries, as he couldn't pay them due to a lack of taxes and insufficient plunder, and he began relying on Serbian and Bulgarian Hajduks to bolster his ranks. Operations across all of northern Bulgaria continued throughout the summer of 1596, causing massive economic damage. Another Tatar army was ordered to pass through Vlahia and join the Ottoman army in Hungary. The Tatars sacked Buzau, Gergita, and Bucharest, but were defeated and chased over the Danube into Torbruja. Meanwhile, Mehmed III dealt a massive defeat to a combined Austrian and Transylvanian army in the Battle of Mezokarestes. Two more Transylvanian attacks were repelled on the fortress of Lipova and Timisoara, which were key for controlling the Banat region. Shaken by these defeats, Austria and Transylvania looked to negotiate a truce. The break in hostilities opened up a possibility for a major Ottoman invasion of Lahia, and Mihai scrambled to get more troops to prepare for a possible attack. To raise funds for new troops, Mihai introduced dreadfully harsh measures. He essentially enslaved his own population by forbidding all classes of serfs from leaving the estates on which they worked. This gave the boyars immense power over the serfs that worked their land, and they imposed taxes higher than ever on the peasants in order to make the high payments to the voivod. These measures may have been a pragmatic way to defend Vlahia, but they squeezed the life out of the country's poorest people. And although Mihai's reputation was high because of his spectacular victories against the Ottomans, these measures diminished his popularity among his people. And in addition to heavily taxing his people, the voivod sent a delegation to Rudolf II, asking him to pay for 4,000 mercenaries from imperial coffers to help fight the Ottomans. The Emperor agreed, seeing this as an opportunity to take away some of the pressure from Austria and shift the fighting into Vlahia and northern Bulgaria. Another hope was that Mihai would be able to push back the Ottomans and motivate Bulgarians, Serbians and Albanians to revolt. Mihai now had a standing army of around 13,000 fighting men, and he resumed his attacks all along the Danube. The devastation of the countryside, roads and infrastructure was so severe that the bigger towns and cities in northern Bulgaria became completely isolated and cut off from the rest of the empire. Furthermore, he transported some 16,000 Christian Bulgarian peasants into Vlahia, whom he provided with land, aiming to increase his tax base. But in his rear, Voivod, Jeremia, and his nobles were planning to overthrow and replace him with a pretender by the name of Simon, Jeremia's younger brother. To make matters worse, Sigismund abdicated the Transylvanian throne due to many internal and external problems. Mihai made another proposition to Rudolf II, the unification of Transylvania and Vlahia under Mihai's rule in order to continue the war against the Ottomans with the help of Transylvania's resources. Rudolf refused and began planning to seize Transylvania for himself. Surrounded on all sides, Mihai was forced to seek peace with the Ottomans. He took advantage of his successes on the battlefield and the mass destruction he caused in Bulgaria to gain favourable terms. He kept the fortresses on the Danube and was recognised by the Sultan as the ruler of Lahia. The Vlahian Voivod was now free to deal with his Christian enemies in order to secure his country. Speaking of security, in today's times, our online activity can be easily tracked. NordVPN ensures the security of our personal information by providing military-grade encryption that even a supercomputer could not hack into. A host of security and privacy features will enable you to connect to any Wi-Fi hotspot, cellular network, and more, as well as bypassing content restrictions while staying anonymous. NordVPN is ranked as the number one VPN provider by PCMag and was selected as the best VPN service by VPN Mentor. But besides offering the best online security and privacy, NordVPN is also a streaming beast. For example, you can watch movies on Netflix at lightning speed from anywhere in the world, 
thanks to over 5,200 high-performing servers in over 60 countries. Just pick your location to begin surfing and streaming in no time, all while maintaining absolute online privacy and security. Click on the link in the description and use our promo code to get 75% off your membership and sign up for only $2.99 a month. Plus, you get an additional month free. Special thanks goes to Albert Weber, the author of Corpus Draculanium, for his extensive research. This miniseries would not have been possible without him. Credit also goes to our awesome patrons for giving us the means to produce videos like this one. With YouTube ads revenue going down, the continued support from our patrons makes a world of difference. Consider joining them to help support our work. As always, thank you for watching.